Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Greg Niemeyer, professor for media arts at UC Berkeley in art practice. And I'm so thrilled to see you here today. I want to say hi to Paris, to Ariana, our speaker, to Hala and Edgar, our grad uh, uh, students who are supporting this course. And I want to thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank Paris Coates, uh, Su Min Chu, and all the members of the arts and design team at Berkeley for supporting this lecture series with their work. I also thank the College of Letters and Sciences, the Berkeley Art Museum, and the Division of Arts and Humanities for their support of this lecture series through their web, uh, webinar uh, platform, and also the course, which is focusing on visual cultures and the aesthetic of the digital. I also want to thank Shannon Jackson, Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design, for leading and creating the Arts and Design program in the first place, and to our two grad students in our practice, Hala Kadura and Edgar Fabian Frias, for their hard work teaching this course with me. And of course, I'm thrilled to um, welcome all you uh, students and uh, members of the audience, the public, the general public. This lecture is a gift. It's free and public, and uh, I hope you appreciate it. However, these are very stressful and uncertain times. The red sky in California, the neon green pandemic, and the relentless racism and hyperpolarization take their toll on all of us. Today, I'm especially sad to see that our colleague, Professor Kenyatta Hinkle, resigned from her position as professor at UC Berkeley because she did not find the support she was seeking at our institution and in our department. Her resignation causes all of us to pause and to ask how we can do more to support, support each other in these uh, challenging and difficult times. Our lecture today is also about support. It is about how uh, Ariana Schindler, who graduated from UC Berkeley in 2015, is a, now an artist and designer who can support her chosen family, her elected community of neo-alt uh, members uh, with her art. May she inspire us all. There's a painter named Abbot Thayer, and he painted uh, animals that were hidden in the woods and he discovered thereby the concept of camouflage and articulated it very clearly. He also invented the uh, uniform that is camouflaged to protect uh, soldiers. But um, he commented that humans are the only species that thrive on visibility. Everybody else, all other creatures, thrive on invisibility, on not being seen. We thrive on being seen. Los Angeles artist Ariana Schindler takes visibility to a confrontational level with her subversive designs for her community and for countercultural fashion brand Damage Group. Join Schindler for an online conversation about what drives her and what, why clothes are an effective means of provocation. Ariana Schindler graduated, as I mentioned, from UC Berkeley in 2015 with a degree in anthropology and a minor in art practice and global poverty studies. She is concerned with contemporary aesthetics, personal expression, and critical analysis of the status quo. She utilizes her experience in the underground arts to relate experimental designs to broader audiences. Her previous work includes creative direction, fashion design, illustration for artists, and activists such as Pussy Riot and Lil Sean, and curation of many uh, uh, main, uh, mainstream and subversive events. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ariana Schindler today. And uh, I have a few more comments to make before we go into the lecture directly. Let's see, here's a slide. So Ariana Schindler's talk is called Anti-Everything, which is a fabulous title. And uh, uh, I wanted to mention that we have a few et etiquette points to make, uh, which is that public attendees have to register in advance. Uh, you've done that if you're here. Um, I wanted to mention that audio and video is turned off for all attendees um, uh, unless you request uh, to be uh, made uh, live so we can have you ask a question directly. But most questions will be handled through the Q&A feature, which is at your bottom screen, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, so if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A and uh, um, Hala and Edgar will pose them to our speaker today. Uh, that being said and housekeeping being done, please join me in welcoming Ariana Schindler. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I'm visiting New York right now, um, but I did bring a few personal items that I've made that I want to share with you all. So the first item is a mask that goes like this. And uh, my roommate hand sewed this and then I pierced 
all of these individual piercings. Another item are these gloves that I embroidered this Jester character on. And then the other one has cobwebs. And then this is an so, item. Uh, when yeah. you go shopping with your mask and your uh, gloves like that, what kind of reactions do you get? Um, I don't really get that many reactions from the mask, except people like asking me where I got it because it's pretty unique, I think. Um, I really like this mask because, you know, there's a lot of surplus of masks being created right now and like a lot of waste being created. And I think it's really important to, you know, like make something for yourself if you have the capacity to because, um, I don't know, it's just, it's better, I think, for the environment and also to like have a direct relationship to this thing that everyone has to wear every single day that's also like a form of expressing yourself. Um, and then this is another item. It is a thong. And it says antiviral on it, which is also very relevant to the times. But um, it's, it's a collaboration piece that I did with Damage a few years back. It's one of my favorite pieces. So you did this way before COVID-19. Yeah, yeah, the whole collection was called antiviral and had a lot of images that alluded to um, things like outbreak and contagion narratives. Are, are, are you a prophetess or is that work that just needs to be done and announces itself in your imagination somehow? Um, I just have like a general interest in medical anthropology and so I'm constantly thinking about how our bodies are vulnerable to sickness and just like in our day-to-day -day existence. Thank you, okay. Okay. So there's this innate attraction to hellish and dark motifs that are adopted by people who have been ostracized by those who idolize pureness. And this is referential to a scale of good versus evil. For those who have never identified with the rigidity of societal constraints, to find a home in the darkness is a form of empowerment, but also a conversation about the world and the codes we live by. Pain and destruction are everywhere. Some people are able to sweep it under the rug, lead normal lives congruent with what we are behaviorally taught as normal. But the reality for some is the darkness of this world is in the foreground. Over time, myself and others have adapted to find the beauty in that and embrace it. The work I make is mired in thematic darkness, not as an intentional gesture, as much a reflection of an emotional response to my surroundings and a desire to push past a facade of functionality or perfection. The underground has always been rejected by society because the very nature of its existence is to be not of this world. It is often met with criticism, judgment, even disgust. But the underground takes this criticism and turns it into their strength. In doing so, fringe communities with a unique visual representation are established based on a commonality of inferred meaning. I would define the aesthetic of the scene that I'm in as neo-alternative. Neo because it's taking from multiple underground subcultures and constructing something new and relevant based on the present moment. It's a movement away from the ordinary and a movement so provocative that the result is genuine discomfort and those unable to understand critical thinking and freedom of expression. This freedom of expression and alternate value system challenges the boundaries of what is considered appropriate or acceptable. Some examples of how value systems diverge from common culture are a disinterest in moral order, against adhering to the structure of social class, attitudes against mass production, capitalism, socially imposed behavioral constrictions, and the desire to find family and community. A lot of people who live alternatively often have experiences in regular life where they didn't fit in. Personally, I struggled with authority growing up. I was always getting in trouble. I was sent to the principal pretty much every day. I was also bullied for how I dressed and acted. For me, this resulted in the beginning of opposition to the status quo. I started to question everything around me. I've always been attracted to the darker side of things. I remember my dad bringing me into a record store when I was really young, and I had no idea what my taste of music even was at that time. And I went through all of the CDs and I found this one image of this man, and he was all white with crazy makeup and his body was genderless and contorted. And um, it was a Marilyn Manson CD. And I chose it because I felt a connection to the vis visuals, but 
ultimately when I started to listen to him, I felt a strong connection to his message and just like the angst that was being portrayed because I had that angst within me as well. When you're bullied by the popular kids who present themselves as robots of perfection, as it relates to what we're told is pretty or cool, it makes going in the opposite direction more appealing. When I talk to all my peers, they have similar stories, stories of not being accepted for who they were in their formative years. It can result in a kind of cynicism about the world and thus an emotional response to things that are different because we want something different for our lives. As I've gotten older, I've become more confident in what makes me unique. I've been able to use it as a strength and embody it. Authenticity is really important. Um, it's easy to tell when someone is appropriating certain imagery for a reason that isn't innately within them, especially if that imagery, you know, has a certain relationship with you. To be a part of an alternative culture that pushes the boundaries of what is accepted as the norm, you need to exist sometime, like to an extent outside of that norm or status quo. And it's those who strike the balance between creative proficiency, lifestyle, and who are able to take the biggest risks that move everything forward. The people who are the innovators are those who go to new extremes, extremes that are often met with initial mass unacceptability. If it is experimental and radical and in opposition to high or mainstream culture, in the beginning, it will disturb people. Essentially, the neo alternative rejects an artificially synthesized mass culture in favor of new methods of representation. So these are a few snippets of my work. I identify mostly as an illustrator, but I also build installations, do design commissions, work in fashion and curate. I started stippling after reading the Russian criminal tattoo encyclopedia, many of the black and white tattoos utilize dots for shading. I was also conceptually interested in the art because the symbolism is highly political, anti-authoritarian against cops and rules that govern us, which is something my art practice has always been in conversation with. For example, there was a period of time where I was doing a lot of graffiti, which came after an arrest for direct action which made me crave a different kind of expression of anger at things I felt to be systematically unjust. But painting the same thing over and over became too repetitive and I started drawing because I was able to experiment more and take the time to construct a different kind of visual experience. A lot of my work is based on my understanding of power dynamics and I like to juxtapose vulnerability and innocence with fear and suffering. I've always been influenced by goth sub subculture. Going to BDSM parties came hand in hand with that because it was a place I could go where people dressed like me or had similar interests. I also use a lot of black metal typography. It's not legible and its organic shapes look alien to me. It takes typography to the furthest brink of relevance. It's chaotic, but also free. Lately, I've been inspired by more futuristic and dystopian aesthetics. The, the divisiveness of the world and a real need for humans to evolve so that they treat each other better has led me to cling to a fantasy of the future. So I want to show some examples of the Russian criminal tattoos. So they all look like this. They're pretty, you know, like traditional looking flash tattoo images, but I mean, definitely not traditional tattoo style. Um, an example of pointillism or stippling being used for the shading would be this image. So it's a lot of like repetitive dots. And if you see there's like a skull and barbed wire and a star and like a lot of these images are things that I end up like using in a lot of my work. And then this is black metal typography. So you can see that it definitely looks not of this world and also very illegible. May I ask what's the reason why to use symmetry often? It, symmetry is emphasized in many of these. Um, you know what? I don't know if there's like a specific reason aside from it just being pleasurable to look at, but I also feel like to say that it's pleasurable to look at also doesn't make that much sense considering, um, you know, a lot of these images are like really stark and kind of also disturbing. So I don't know. I think maybe the contrast between something like being appealing to the eye, but also at the same time making you want to take a little bit of a step back. So, so like attraction or repulsion happening at the same time? Yeah, like the relationship between those two things. But I don't think that that's an intentional gesture. I think that I think it just kind of creates this shape that becomes an item in and of itself, you know? It's like its own little universe. That's how I feel when I'm doing like that kind of typography. I'm trying to create something 
it's like balanced but also dramatic yeah thank you okay so this is one of the clothing brands i illustrate for um damage is based out of taipei their aesthetic is cyberpunk combined with a futuristic goth and rave style there's conceptual depth to the pieces that are created. For example, my first collection with them was called Antiviral. It was sort of a textile inoculation that reflected on both the weakness and strength of power structures that render us susceptible to physical or emotional harm. I was thinking a lot about biopolitics and how governments have the power over people's lives to either let them live or die, and wanted to reflect this imagery with symbolism like mosquitoes and biohazard signs, chains and drawings of computers. The second collection I did with them was Purgatory, which made use of Precious Moments Images, a Christian brand. I redrew the Precious Moments characters in precarious or satanic situations. For example, a Precious Moments character innocently sleeping surrounded by demons. Another one was an angel trapped in a globe of flames and evil clouds. Another one of a girl clutching a teddy bear in front of a monster emerging from an open door. Damage's other collections touch on geopolitical themes revolving around government corruption, global strife, surveillance, technology, essentially any topic that is making the world, in some cases, a worse place to live for the ordinary person. So I'm going to go to my Instagram and show you some of the drawings that I did for the first collection with Damage. So here are the precious moments drawings. So you can see it's like this angelic little boy, but he's trapped in this globe and there's this evil spider crawling, just kind of like waiting for something to happen. And inside the globe, there's this demon cloud, but there's also like this happy star. So there's this juxtaposition of good versus evil, but there's also like a balance. Here's another one. And then I can show you how um, they were printed on the clothes. So here's one image from that collection. Here's another one. So this is the image of the, the character in the globe. We took the globe out, but the cloud is still there. And that was embroidered on the top. And then the first collection that I did with them, the antiviral one, here's the thong that I showed you guys. You can show them a little bit longer. We've never seen these oh, okay. before. <laughs> okay. I know you've seen them many times. <laughs> There's an aesthetic to the way it's photographed as well. Do you want to address that? Um, yeah, it kind of has this grit to it. Um, you know, a lot of it is in like alleyways or there's um, these industrial backgrounds. Um, and I don't know, it's kind of existing like outside of everything. I really like this one. So, um, the woman on the left is wearing the antiviral top. So I don't know if you can see it too well, but there's a laptop and inside the laptop is a mosquito and then beneath her is this little anime head and then there's a biohazard symbol above it with um, some, some like barbed wire. When you do a collection, how many motifs do you typically need to generate for, and obviously there's going to be a selection and so forth. So how many motifs do you start with and how many do you end up with? Um, probably like five to eight and then around like four to five are chosen. Yeah. Thank you. So neo alternative expression can be seen in fine art when artists express the tension between pushing the limits of self creation and maintaining authenticity to express uncensored ideas. So these images are from a show I curated at the San Diego Art Institute. The work was intended to navigate the viewer through a post human environment with artwork alluding to nostalgia and pain. 
I wanted an exploration of the relationship between dystopian aesthetics and to showcase underground creators who hope for the disintegration of normativity. Um, the show ended up being so offensive to some people that our PR firm literally quit on us two weeks before the opening because they said that like the show's aesthetic was not in alignment with the values of the firm. So that was kind of interesting as far as like opposition is concerned because um, it was essentially their job to publicize this whole thing, but they wanted to keep it hidden away because they thought it was too provocative. Um, and then the the installation that's pink um, with the bricks on shelves is my piece. Um, I built the the center of it out of latex. Um, I actually built that in a sex shop that my friend worked at and we like hand cut all the leather and um, like put in all the metal pieces together. So you have this sort of celebration of an ugly underworld, making it beautiful and bringing it to the fore and a subsequent demonstration of artistic talent and capacity. So the idea of the fantasy is the guiding force in a lot of things that are being created right now um, in the scene that I'm in, because what's being created is not a mirror of what is being seen, but rather a view into what is unseen, for example, power. To immerse oneself into an alternative culture means finding new ways of expression, alternative modalities for navigating life, and the structures that render us susceptible to conformity. Provocation through visual expression is a direct response to our vulnerability, and it's one that brings strength to those who feel the oppressive nature of everything around us. The clothes we wear, the art we make, all in defiance, creates a micro universe that hopefully is a little bit kinder. So, Within this neo-alternative scene that I'm talking about, um, I kind of see it as a lot of different subcultures that have existed in the past kind of coming together. Like people are assigning a certain value and a certain relationship with other images and other mindsets that have existed and how those are aesthetically represented. And then within that, people are constructing something new. So. I chose punk, goth, and fetish wear to kind of like identify the image that's being created because all these cultures are very similar and that they're a visual rejection of normative behavior and aesthetic representation. But also if you just look at the specifics of things like, for example, this mask with all of the piercings, you know, this is pretty punk. Um, these gloves are, are pretty goth. And so what's happening is all of these different styles are coming together and what's being created is kind of like a mishmash and a new kind of version. So being an individual and not like a sheep in a flock requires independence. And with that, a willingness to experiment with how you dress or do, you, do your makeup in ways that are different than what's been done before. Punk specifically is all about not conforming to the status quo. So punk fashion pushes against cultural norms. There is a heavy emphasis on DIY thrift and reconstruction adopted to show autonomy. And DIY means to do it yourself. Leather jackets, zippers, patches, spikes, plaid, fluorescent hair, dramatic makeup are all kind of indicators of being punk, but it's also very much a mindset and like a, a rebellion. Um, goth aesthetic is dark, morbid, and marked by antiquated features. Styles are often borrowed from punk fashion um, and also the Victorian period, and oftentimes depicts religious or occult themes. Um, things commonly seen are like black velvets, lace, fishnets, leather, corsets, gloves, boots, silver, jewelry, stuff like that. Um, and when I showed my slides to Greg, he pointed out that the makeup on this model, who was shot by Parker Day, I'll get into her photography in a little bit, um, is very subversive because it would be undetectable in facial recognition software. Fetish wear reverses and transmutes the social meaning of restrictive clothing. Designs are based on elements that are not accepted by the mainstream and worn to evoke a particular reaction. So like the nature of fetish wear is that like it's inciting something in someone um, off, you know, very often that thing is like a sexual reaction, but other times it can just be like 
a different kind of reaction. And materials such as leather, latex, or synthetic rubber, plastic, nylon, PVC, spandex, fishnet, and stainless steel are often used. Um, with my own art practice, I find myself using a lot of these materials. I'm like very drawn to latex. Um, that's what the, the sculpture that I showed at San Diego Art Institute was made out of. It also had like rubber components and um, like metal as well. So it's, I like juxtaposing all those materials together. Um, the majority of the people into neo alternative aesthetics and values congregate in the underground nightlife. It's a place where they can have a good time and escape the boredom and pressures of normal life. Raves have historically been DIY organized, anti-establishment and unlicensed all night dance parties. To give some perspective on the importance these parties play, um, I was at this party that I, you know, go to every Saturday from like two to 6 a.m. And I remember I was sitting upstairs in this room with everyone that I was close to and we all kind of had this realization that like, whoa, this is kind of our church in a sense. You know, we come here every single weekend. We're around the same people. There's a lot of, you know, things that are involved. Like you have to, you know, get ready in a certain way. And um, you're kind of presenting yourself in this certain fashion and you're able to connect with other people that are like you. And it's the safe space where you can express yourself with other people who have the same values as you. And so that's like really important for communities that exist on the fringe because connectivity is, is kind of like what gives us the strength to keep going. So yeah, you get like a real community of people whose purpose is similar, who all believe in the same things and people who feel disenfranchised and oppressed by the mundane of the day to day. <clears throat> and also another important thing is that club cultures are taste cultures. So like knowing the latest trends or like what is stylish or provocative translates to almost like a kind of coolness. Um, it's also one of the few places where there is social value in looking extreme, which it allows it to be a breeding center for counterculture aesthetics. And it's also fixated on fantasy. So you're able to step out of your everyday life. And it's a place where people can have this sort of like reflection on the relationship between um, their own almost maybe sense of purposelessness, purposelessness and then like the landscape that we exist within. So this is an example of a party in Los Angeles called Heaven. So you can see all the different styles that people have. They're all very unique, but also similar in a lot of ways. And this is another party called Soft Leather, which is more of um, a BDSM party. So there's a little bit darker vibes here, more leather, more latex. So mainstream culture looks to alternative fashion. Um, when a previously non-mainstream style becomes popular, it kind of waters down the, it's like watered down with individuals who are not genuinely invested in the scene. And it kind of can prevent an image of the subculture not related to its traditional message or behaviors. And like, as someone who's in the underground, you can have success in the mainstream and it can bring exposure, but it also contributes to dilution because the message is like a function of the purpose. So once the purpose shifts, the message is no longer the same. So these are some examples of this kind of style in the mainstream. You can see on the left, like a metal font, kind of gothic attire. In the center, Justin's looking very punk with his Marilyn Manson shirt. And on the right is Poppy. What's interesting about Poppy is that she had, her whole brand was based off of this like bubble gum, super pop, super pink, super happy aesthetic. And then in the last year, she completely became metal. All of her music became new metal and then her whole entire aesthetic changed. So it's kind of interesting how people kind of use these, um, this aesthetic and can, apply it almost like as a costume. More mainstream imitation. <clears throat> um, so, and these are some examples of people who are very mainstream, 
but who within the underground, we all like really respect these de designers because their whole personality and their everything they do is really rooted in the values of the scene that we're in. So for example, like Alexander McQueen, Vivian Westwood and Rick Owens, um, all are really respected. And they also do like a lot of innovative things. So this is Fecal Matter. Um, Fecal Matter is a Canadian based duo and their whole message is provocation. And this is not just like something they do for photographs or for likes, this is their whole life. Like every single day, this is actually how they dress. Um, and they really like embody the DIY nature of everything. They make everything themselves and like all the clothes, all the edits, everything that they do. Um, and there's, there are two people that this subculture like really looks up to, but also has pushed things forward as far as like alien aesthetics are concerned. And I want to show you a video of them talking a little bit about their work. Well, to be honest, these, I, this, this idea came from when I used to draw when I was really... For my meal kit delivery, I chose the vegetarian box and the meals that I received were the salsa verde enchiladas. Young, so um, drawing was kind of an escape for me. I kind of went through a lot. Yeah. Let's see if we watch it smaller. Okay, cool, but, uh, so yeah, so basically when we met each other, we were able to just create them and that's really the kind of beginning. But the intention behind it is to question what it means to be human. And that's something that we really draw a lot of inspiration from, from our work. And that's really the, the intention behind it. You two clearly have a great connection, uh, creative collaboration. Is this though like performance art? Is when I first saw it, Hannah, it kind of made me think of Lady Gaga and her meat suit. Right. Right? I mean, for us, we created Fecal Matter or Mathieu Fecal, our brand, as more of a platform to express uncensored ideas and really to help people around the world to question reality and to use critical thinking. So we want people to look outside and look at reality and ask questions. And um, for us, our designs, such as these shoes, do that. For us, performance, um, you know, for me, everyone's in performance. Somebody wearing a suit, that's a performance also, just as much as me in flower hair and skin boots. Yeah but you're a little more out there yes. which is fine because that's how you're getting attention and how you're you're sort of telling your story um what are they made of Stephen? uh they're made of silicone silicone yes okay exactly. and so yeah that's fecal matter and um for the show that i did at san diego art institute i was able to show some of their garments as well as have them come for the opening to dj <laughs> so I'm going to show you guys um, some other creatives that are in the scene that, you know, kind of embody this um, connection between punk, goth, fetish aesthetics, but also really embody the ethos behind everything. So the first person is Shai Snyder, um, also known as Pulling Teeth. Her look is definitely like very punk. She makes all of her clothes and she also like hand paints everything. Um, for example, like this jacket, she hand sewed this patch um, on the dress and the image on the left. And even just, you know, the way she portrays herself, the blood dripping out of her mouth, the cigarette on her tongue, it's definitely this like, I don't give a fuck attitude and I'm gonna do whatever I want. This is Dante, also known as Saint Terror. Um, his aesthetic is very goth and punk. Um, and you can see the influence of all these things. For example, on his neck, the lacy kind of like braces holding his head up and the, all the piercings, you know, the piercings are more punk. The necklace is a little bit more goth. The pants are very punk. And he also makes jewelry and grills and plush toys. So one thing that's kind of important is that all of these creators, they're not just like creating one item. They're not just like, oh, I'm a jewelry maker. Oh, I'm this or I'm that. They embody the whole, like all the values and the aesthetic into themselves, but they're also creating a unique world of representation that kind of falls in line with 
how they're reconstructing all of these ideas that have come before us. So this is Fluff Lord. Um, she is based in Berlin. She does a lot of rendery stuff, um, but it's also in the same vein, very demonic. Um, the image in the top right, it's, you know, it's very referential to metal letters. And um, she did an installation, uh, which is what's in the bottom left, the screen that says fight, which is, you know, also like a conversation in and of itself because like we're fighting back for what we want, you know, and against like what we believe oppresses us. This is VVXXII. Um, I've collaborated with him a lot. The sculpture that I showed in the very beginning, I can show it to you guys again if you want. Um, we did that together. And um, he does everything from like video work to club flyers to wearable items to um, street art and public installation. So he's really, really versatile. And his work is like definitely super alien and his whole lifestyle, like he's a, he's kind of like a grifter and just like embodies this like gypsy mentality. This is Ziska. She's an illustrator and also a tattoo artist. Um, her work is very futuristic, very alien. Also punk, you know, with the character on the bottom left with the spiky hair. And this is Carlos. He is um, a designer for Ghost Main, and a lot of his work is referential to metal. Um, also, it's futuristic, very dark, but also punk too. Um, with the way images are scanned and like the graininess of things and the repetition. So among all of these things, there's a lot of commonality in terms of the images that are being presented. Um, there's forlorn, mystic, satanic, alien, futuristic, and morbid motifs. And a lot of the common imagery is like skulls, wings, bones, demonic creatures, sacrilegious symbols, bugs, ghosts, Wings, weapons, wizards, clowns, snakes, barbed wire, brick, fire, chains, metal letters, and tribal design. And it keeps going. But like after I wrote this list and then I kind of like looked back at everything, I was like, whoa, like this is literally almost everything that is in everyone's stuff. Um, but it's all very, um, it's all very dark and it also is kind of in conversation with the underworld, so to speak. So in the scene, not only are people like making clothes or DJing or doing art, but there's also people that are documenting everything that's happening. And one of the people documenting things is this photographer, Ben Goth. Um, all of his photos are kind of in the moment of real things that are happening. You know, sometimes, or at least lately, he's been staging things because, you know, the nightlife is definitely different now that we're in Corona times. But in the past, you know, he would just capture things as they were happening around him and gives a really good sense of like the scene. This is Parker Day. She shoots everything on film in her studio and her work really captures like the individuality of each person and each um, way they choose to portray themselves. And there's also like a lot of collaboration between all of these people that I'm mentioning. Um, for example, um, the second photo on the top uh, left is an image of someone who's actually wearing a piece from the damage collection. Um, so everyone's kind of like interested in sharing with each other and helping each other style things or helping each other do makeup and um, all kind of creating with this within this universe and trying to make it as like interesting and crazy as it can look. So in the underground, there's this kind of dichotomy of utopia and dystopia. Dystopian images can represent a loss of control and comes from a society that doesn't work. Alternative subcultures are born out of a dis dissatisfaction, but also a desire to create something beautiful. So it ends up visually reflecting the relationship between function and dysfunction in society. With fashion, one can dress up as different roles and view it as an outsider. With art, one can create a universe to escape to or one that is reflective of things hidden away. 
at a rave, you can go there and be whoever you want to be. Like beauty, the meaning of subculture has changed. It splinters, blurs, builds on, and rapidly transforms group mentality. But it is its own outlet for exploring identity and making political statements. Nowadays, with social media, creatives can trace connections between people all over the globe with little else linking them, and innovators can congregate based on shared values. The curated expression of self allows for a connection between like-minded artists, connections that develop into real friendship and real friendship that develops into collaboratory movement. To navigate the desire for personal growth and success while actively creating an opposition to systems that oppress us takes skill. But those who possess the strength to push themselves create a safe space for others to do the same. Artists are also creating and documenting a very divisive historical landscape and are essentially forced to create their own places for themselves because they haven't been given one. So therefore they are more independent, create new rules and a new hierarchy of success that doesn't rely on the approval of others. Artists show that they can be rejected by society but still look after one another. They can still exist even if they don't fit in. And you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for someone who's like, I'm gonna tattoo my whole face or I'm gonna dress like an alien every day and this is just who I am because you're kind of saying like, hey, I don't care if I'm not gonna get hired for your nine to five or like I'm not gonna be accepted at my family dinner or something like that because you don't need to do that. There's another way to live and there's a whole community of people that will be there to support you. So yeah. Bravo, thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, see, can we unmute everybody so we can give uh, Ariana a round of applause? Is that, is that possible? Let's see. People are clapping in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was a beautiful ending. So now I'd like to, uh, we have a whole bunch of questions, Ariana. Great talk, really. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, so thoughtful. Why can't the rest of the world be like uh, the rave culture you describe where there's a collaborative uh, spirit and there's a lot of obviously diversity both in race and in gender and in uh, sexual orientations and uh, how, why can't the world, rest of the world operate like that? What, what, is, what is the secret that makes it work? Um, I think that it's kind of like when you're younger you have to develop your own way of relating to yourself and others if you exist and you feel different from everything around you. And this new level of relatability kind of enables different forms of interaction to occur because you're more receptive to connecting with someone who's maybe a little bit different than you know what you would expect. And you're able to see someone's weirdness or something and actually find the beauty in that and appreciate that. So more self-awareness leads to more um, empathy maybe as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very inspiring. Thank you. I like that. And uh, uh, so Edgar and uh, Hala, please take it away with a, we have a whole bunch of questions here. And anybody in the audience, if you want to uh, add more questions to the Q&A, please go ahead. And we have um, lots of thank yous and lots of uh, exclamation marks and lots of your necklace is sick. What's, our, what's the story with your necklace? Um, okay, this necklace was made by my friend Tom. He actually just started a jewelry company. So this was the prototype of it. And it has my birthstones and the eyes, which are ovals. Um, so this necklace is like really special to me. And then this necklace I got when I was in Tokyo last, I believe it was October. Um, I was in Taipei first doing um, an installation and then a release of a collection of damage. And then my friends were doing a really cool performance um, in Tokyo. So I, I like wandered around and went in some stores and I found this guy and I really like him. All right, cheers. Okay, Edgar Hala, let's go with the questions. Yeah, um, like you said, we have a lot of questions. Um, some of them here that Hala and I have picked from the people who are live. And if people are open when we call on you, if you want to ask your question live, we would love to unmute you and have you ask that question. But the first question I'm going to ask actually comes from our class. It comes from Brandon Panalikan, and it says, how do you see your art and counterculture more broadly evolving as the world becomes more dystopian? I think that it will just get weirder and I also think that 
um, so there's two ways that it can go. One way is that it becomes more antiquated. So like as things are more dystopian, as the relationship between humans and technology kind of evolves, there's the potential for people to kind of take a step backwards and do things that are kind of separate from how we're used to like involving technology in our interactions and what we create. But on the other spectrum, things might become like actually kind of more sci-fi. And I think that that's why um, doing like 3D renders became really popular because it was kind of like a movement into this more um, technologically created visual and also having those things be um, interactive, like sometimes like with VR stuff or um, anything like that. So I think that, um, I think that it'll get become more advanced, like the actual tools that people are using to create things, but also in a conversation away from advancement and like what progress is or isn't, people might go in the opposite direction. And at least for my own art practice, um, the reason why I kind of stick to, to stippling and this like really hands-on thing that a lot of people don't do anymore because it's very time consuming is almost like in conversation with how fast paced our culture is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariana. Um, we have another question from one of our students. Uh, his name is Nathan Johns. And the question is, what barriers, if any, have you experienced in trying to convey certain messages throughout your art? Um, people just thinking that it's weird or scary um, and like not really understanding it and, and their lack of understanding just thinking that it's not good and that I'm like wasting my time and that it'll never amount to anything and that, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And so this question, next question is from someone who's actually here, hopefully they're still here. Um, it's from Jack Larkins. Um, Jack, if you're there, um, I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself if you want to ask the question that you have in the Q&A. Are you able Hi, to can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Hi, I can hear you. Yes. Um, hi, thank you so much for joining us. So, you mentioned um, there was a slide with one of the Kardashians, which was perfect. Um, and just regarding your, this notion of um, imitation by mainstream, mm -hmm. um, you said that you know mainstream adoption can definitely dilute the purpose or message of a certain countercultural um, aesthetic or, or project. Um, so I'm curious how you sort of reconcile the idea of ownership by the designer with the idea of the expressive freedom of, you know, the copycats on Instagram? Um, I think that pretty much there's, okay, so if someone that I knew did something and they became very successful doing it and that image became mainstream, if they were coming from a place of authenticity within their creation and the reason why they sold their design to this company, for example, was so that they had money to like eat or pay rent. Um, I think that that is okay. And yes, while dilution can be a result and while it does like have an effect on the aesthetic of a certain kind of scene, um, you know, eating and living is kind of important. But on to like contrast that, if some brand, for example, goes on Instagram, like there are brands whose jobs are literally to just go through Instagram and find artists that aren't big and just like steal their artwork. Um, that's not really okay. So I kind of, that's where I draw the line. I think that if the artist who's creating is authentic and, you know, actually you know, creates a space for others to maybe even collaborate with this artist. So like, let's say you get asked to do something for a brand that's really big and you're getting paid a lot. Well, you can now ask two of your friends to help you and then they're gonna get paid too. So there is strength sometimes in being able to like get picked up for a mainstream stream gig. The main issue I have is when mainstream companies that don't reflect the ethos of the scene steal from the aesthetic of the scene. Gotcha. Does that answer your question? 
yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Amazing, thank you so much. We have another question from one of our students from Siraj Patel. The question is, how did the community at Berkeley influence your work today? Um, I actually don't think I was really um, influenced by the Berkeley community. I mean, as far as um, my conceptual understanding of things, yes, I was very influenced because um, I learned like everything that I know and my capacity to articulate anything is from being a student at Berkeley and reading everything. You know, I studied anthropology. It's a whole entire social analysis and, you know, reading people like Foucault and like, you know, you really get an understanding of power and knowledge. And um, I was, you know, I'd always felt this sense of um, like critical analysis within me, but I never had the toolbox to express myself. So I was definitely influenced conceptually but as far as like aesthetics and as far as like scenes are concerned I didn't really get that from Berkeley I got that more from venturing out into Oakland and being a part of like the punk and DIY music scene there so I, I never really identified with like Berkeley as a as like a place where I had a scene um it was kind of it felt a little bit homogenized to me and I didn't really um meet that many people there that I felt I had a strong connection with Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is from someone who I'm hoping is still here. So if you, um, they can be unmuted. Their name is Dominic Masoto. Um, if you want to ask your question, Dominic. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much for talking. Uh, I really liked your point about um, how true artistic innovation is initially met with rejection by the masses. Um, I just want to know, in your opinion, how does one move past those initial feelings of rejection and understand the true value of their art? Um, for me personally, I think that that value kind of has to come from within you. And it's helpful to have people that you're really close to give you like an honest opinion about things, people who kind of have the same idea of things as you and the same reference points to be able to assess if something's like good or bad. But I mean, good and bad is subjective. I think that, um, you know, if you really do feel like what you're doing is important and if it's good, then it is to someone else out there, you know? Uh, maybe if people in your immediate surroundings don't necessarily see it yet. And so for me, like, I've just kind of kept doing the same thing and the same thing. and you know, there's a lot of periods of time where like, I don't get any work or like, I don't get any shows or like no one's printing any of my stuff, but I still just keep doing it because it's what I love to do. It's just like my passion. And so I think that um, if you really love something, you should just kind of keep doing it and you'll get better at it too. You know, the more that you do it, you'll get better. Sweet, thank you. I was nodding the whole time, but you can't see it. I cannot see you now. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Ariana, that was very inspiring. Uh, so thank you. Just keep doing it. <laughs> I love that. Uh, we have a question from our audience, Jamaica Gilmore. I'm wondering if you're still here. Yes. Um, Amazing. Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just posted a question in there. Um, the question, uh, really has to do with um, just kind of how I got exposed to like punk and goth and stuff like that and just DIY art in general uh, was kind of through a bit of a traumatic experience through the 2008 recession and like having to like kind of come up with creative ways of uh, having self-expression um, after like our family didn't really have very much money. Um, and I was wondering like if other people experienced a similar thing or if you feel like um, kind of economic hardship leads to creativity and if maybe that's something that we might see a little bit more of because of our current you know economic state mm -hmm. so yeah definitely I think um, you know part of being punk and like dressing punk is reconstructing your own clothes and you know, that involves a lot of time going to thrift stores and, um, you know, cutting and sewing things and making things really your own. So I do think that um, when people don't have the money to like buy things that they might want, you know, 
they can make them themselves. And um, if you are creatively inclined, most likely you will. Um, I don't know if necessarily um, more people will start doing stuff like that. I think that with everything that's happening, there's also kind of um, a lot of cynicism that's happening that's almost, it's like pretty dark, but almost in a way that isn't necessarily productive because um, a lot of people just feel really stuck right now, at least personally for me, like at first I was like creating a lot when all this happened, but then I kind of like got to a point, especially like with all the riots and everything that was happening where I was like, wait, I like don't want to make anything because I kind of didn't really know what the point was. I kind of felt like me putting all this stuff out there was just like clogging feeds of like other things that were more important. And, um, and then like as some time passed, you know, like there is some sort of like self-soothing nature in creation. So I think that, I think that there will be, like there are always going to be people that are interested in like making their own stuff or there will be people that like want to exist like alternative to the status quo and when things are like going really wrong in the world there's definitely like more of an understanding of things that are normally swept under the rug are now like in the foreground and so people are now like more in tune to this and therefore um, more likely to feel like a sense of angst or like critical opposition to the world that we live in and see things more clearly and things that had always been there but now like they're just in the foreground you know so people can act upon it and people can um, talk about it. So yeah, I, I do think that there will probably be um, an influx, I guess, of more of this imagery becoming um, popular or like more people just doing it. But I also think that um, coming from no money is, yes, it is like a way for people to continue to see that like money isn't everything. But another way for someone to see that money isn't everything is like if you do come from money and let's say you grew up in a stable house environment and you had like a lot of things that you needed, but maybe your parents fought all the time or maybe like you had issues at school or all of these things. And then you kind of saw that like the comfort of money and excess is actually like not what brings you happiness, that like other things bring happiness. So I think it can go both ways. I don't think that just because you come like or someone might come from like an environment where there's not a lot of wealth or excess that's going to lead you to like going down a certain path i think that this path has like multiple avenues to like get to yeah that makes sense just like the extremes of life mm -hmm. in general yeah yeah definitely i think the that's a perfect point it's like a reflection of extremity mm -hmm. cool thanks you're welcome Let's do uh, one more question and then let's, I have a, a little thing I want to do at the very end. So go ahead, one more question, Edgar. Okay, uh, this question is from one of our students. Um, would you say that, um, her name is, sorry, Dana Fang. Would you say that Instagram is where you're able to spread most of your designs and artwork or is there another platform that you find more effective at reaching people? And then also what impact do you hope to make on the world with your art? <laughs> Um, okay. Well, the Instagram question is easy. Uh, I pretty much only use Instagram. Like I just made a Twitter and I'm still, I don't even know how to do anything on there. Um, or even what to say, but yeah, I think that Instagram is really powerful. I have made so many connections with people all over the world. Like anywhere that I go, I can just find someone who kind of is in the same scene. That's one of the benefits of being in like such a fringe or niche scene is that you do feel like a really strong sense of connectivity between people that you don't even know just because they're like presenting so many similar things as you present to the world. So Instagram has been really cool for me and um, yeah, I really like it a lot. Um, but I don't like how the algorithm has been working lately because it's kind of unfortunate that, um, you know, we're kind of sub subjected to things. It's like, there's now money involved essentially which is unfortunate because in order to have your content reach a larger audience instead of it being organic now you actually have to like pay for it so it could potentially like put certain people at a disadvantage with, when like sharing their work or like getting more um recognized for their work um and then can you repeat the second question again about the world yeah yeah 
Yeah, it was, um, what um, impact do you hope to make on the world with your art? Um, I guess I hope to have people kind of assess their daily lives and, you know, think about what it is that they like really want for themselves. And if they want something different to not be afraid to go and experience that or explore that and to not be afraid to just like pick up and move to the other side of the country on a whim or, or do something like that, but also not be afraid to like experiment with the way that they express themselves, um, the things that they do, like to not be afraid to go to some crazy party because maybe you don't feel like you're cool enough or you're dressed crazy enough because it is a place where like there is commonality and that commonality is like pretty, it can be broad too, you know? And like, we're all humans and like, we all have the capa capacity to connect with one another. So I guess that's what, like I hope for my art is that it inspires people to like connect with each other and also feel inspired to like try new things or to, you know, like take those drawings from under their bed and like post them on Instagram. Cause I used to hide all of my art. I was like, no one needs to see this. Like it's, this is just for me. Like maybe when I die, someone will like pull these out of my bed and then suddenly like someone will know that I did this. But um, I kind of felt like I had a responsibility to share it because um it exists within like the context of the present moment and so to to like not allow people to have a conversation with that reflection is kind of like taking away from an experience someone could have yeah thank you and i and i also feel like you know when you step into your power you many times give permission right to other people to step into their power and i think that's a really beautiful way that we can use social media to inspire each other in that way so thank mm -hmm. you so much i really appreciate um everything thank you yeah, thank you. I'm really happy to have been able to talk to you guys today. Yeah, so um, one thing you did um, earlier when we rehearsed this talk and talked about your work is uh, you encouraged us to change the way we see the world by simply altering our searches um, and entering okay. one word in a, in a Google search engine. And I just wanted to uh, honor that. And can you demonstrate that for us quickly? Yeah, hold on. Um, and that's something we can all take home and do at home as well. So. It's like a, a kind of a portable game, if you will, or artwork. Yeah, so when I'm like, um, so a lot of my work is actually kind of, um, I'm taking like lots of references and I'm kind of like arrange, rearranging them together and like cutting and pasting different things to create like a new image. Um, and so when I'm looking for references, let me just share my screen. Okay. So when I'm looking for references, I'll just type in like demonic or um, like evil or essentially anything that refers to something dark that's like a word and then like whatever it is that I'm looking for. So Greg, why don't you give me an example of something that you would like to search for? Um, demonic lunch. That's, a, that's gonna be interesting. Whoa. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Look at, the, look at the guy with his fists and his face there in the foreground. What a strange drawing. Yeah. The, yeah. This is pretty cool too, even though it's not necessarily lunch related. Wow. Well, it's somebody's lunch. Um, maybe we'll see that on a on a T-shirt or something soon. <laughs> okay, it works. Then another one I did was demonic Berkeley, and guess what came up? The UC Berkeley faculty page. Wait, really? No, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was very funny. Wait. Uh, but I didn't. I guess I did all all uh, rather than images. Yeah. There is that a. Oh, I thought it was like an evil brain, but it's not. <laughs> Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Berkeley Square monster. <laughs> <clears throat> well, thank you so much. Uh, try, yeah, everybody can try that out, I guess. And uh, um, let's give Ariana Schindler one more round of applause. And uh, really, thank you for a deeply inspiring talk. You were very, very generous with us. Thank you. And uh, with that, I want to mention that our next um, speaker is going to be next week at the same place, same time. Tiara Ribot, who's a, a, a futurist artist um, and uh, 
uh, of Pol with a Polynesian background, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, gener regenerative futures, and we're very much looking forward to their talk. So uh, here's the link for that if you want to check it out, and we we'll hope to see you all again, and bring your friends. Uh, good to see you all. Have a good afternoon. Have a good evening, Ariana. Thanks so much again for a beautiful talk. Paris, are we good? Yes, we're good. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we're available on a recording here as well. So if you want to go over this one more time, uh, we can share out the recording with you. Yes, it'll be on the Berkeley YouTube Arts and Design. And um, we'll send you an email link after this talk uh, so you can check it out again. Super. Thank you so much. Okay.